Hey, Charlie Pyatt here. So we're in the final leg of this project. All the parts of the ARVR enclosure have been fabricated or ordered and are ready for finishing. This episode, I'm going to focus on dry fitting and getting any final tweaks to the parts done. After that, I can paint and do some of the final assembly. Let's get to it. One of the first parts I want to wrap up are the carbon fiber components. All I really need to do on these is countersink the flathead screws that will be securing these parts in place. I could have gone with a button head screws instead of the flatheads for all these and skipped having to do the countersinking step, but the flatheads will have a really nice texture change compared to the carbon fiber. The whole thing will just look way cleaner and more professional than having a bunch of screw heads that bump up on those flat carbon fiber parts. I also thought about having the CNC facility that cut all these custom parts to the countersinking, but there are a couple different countersink sizes and mirrored parts, so that would have taken a while to communicate and been prone to mistakes. I found it was easier just to do it on my end in this case. For the countersinking, I'm using a drill press and a cone head carbide bit that has the same 90 degree angle as my screw heads. I just have to make sure I'm countersinking the correct sides of my mirrored left and right side parts. With the carbon fiber parts all done, next I need to get the threaded inserts installed. These are all heat press style inserts, and the way they work is pretty straightforward. You use a soldering iron with a special tip to press them in place. The heat causes the thermal plastic to melt around the spiral knurling on the sides of the insert and secures it into place. The problem in this case is that, generally speaking, heat set inserts don't work with resin based 3D printed parts. I went into this more in episode 4, but filament printers and powder based machines use thermal plastics where heat set inserts work great. On the other hand, resin based parts are made by using UV curing to create a thermal set material, so heat set inserts are usually not usable. The part will usually just shatter or crumble away if you try and install one. After thinking about it a bit, I decided to just say what the hell and try using heat to secure the insert in place, and it kind of worked okay. I did some basic pull testing and they seemed fine. I'm sure they are way weaker than they would be in a normal thermal plastic, but the forces on these should be really minor and are not critical from a safety standpoint or anything, so I think we're good. But yeah, this is one of those cases where you should never use thermal inserts in a resin part, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'll take it over having to go through and glue all these little guys in place throughout the entire assembly. Now that I have all the parts prepped, I just have to paint them. I covered the areas that had mechanical interactions with blue painter's tape to keep them from binding up once everything is installed. I also hole punched out a bunch of tape dots to cover all those inserts I just put in. This will keep the threading from getting fouled up with paint. I'm going to be using double stick shop tape on craft sticks to hold the parts for painting. Fortunately, almost all these parts have an unpainted B-side that will not be visible, so I have a surface to stick them to. Right, so let's get on to painting. I was originally going to use an HVLP gun or airbrush to paint these parts so I could have the best possible color choices, but in the end I just decided to go with a basic rattle can spray paint. The whole point of this project is to make a development test bed that I can quickly modify. I could spend hours priming, sanding, and painting all these little parts, but I feel like all that would do is make me more resistant to modifying the design in the future. And that's the exact opposite of what I'm trying to do here, so again, I'm just going to stick with a quick and dirty solution of spray bombing the parts. I went with a basic cool dark color for the body and a brighter neon for the highlight parts similar to the renderings I've done so far. I could only find that hot pink color I wanted in an acrylic graffiti paint, which isn't ideal. Graffiti paint tends to go on pretty thick and isn't really designed for plastic parts like this, but I think I can make it work. You can see all the finished printed parts here ready to go. I'm pretty happy with the way these things are looking. I could have gotten a cleaner surface and better color saturation if I'd gone through and primed these, but again, I really didn't want to go down that rabbit hole of trying to make perfect parts on a development platform piece. You may have noticed that I haven't done any more work on the custom face gasket or rear pad up until now. I've been going back and forth trying to figure out if I should order these soft parts from an outside 3D print house or do them at home. The Form 3 I have has a flexible 80 durometer resin that would work great mechanically, but it only comes in a clear material color. This isn't good for the face gasket because it would allow pretty significant outside light leakage when I have the headset on. There are print houses that offer other materials that I could use, like in the Carbon 3D printer line. Unfortunately, my parts are pretty large, so this would get really expensive for what I'm trying to do. I also want to print a few of these to continue design testing on the custom face gasket, so I don't want to pay a huge amount every time I have an adjustment or have to wait a week or more for each version to come in. In the end, I decided to go with printing at home in the clear, flexible Formlabs resin. 
The twist here is that I'm going to try and dye the print black after printing. This is another technique I've never done before, but it looks like you can use any alcohol-based dye to get different colors out of the 3D prints. To start things off, I decided to do the small back pad as a test part. I figured doing it this way, if something went wrong with the print or dyeing process, I wouldn't be out that much time or resin. With my back pad printed, I am ready to start the dye process. I have my 99% isopropyl alcohol filled in a plastic container and my alcohol-based dye ready to go. The mix ratio is around 2% dye to IPA, so I just pre-measure my IPA and then add the dye and we'll see how it goes. This whole thing is on a magnetic stirrer, which basically spins this little pellet magnet at the bottom of the mixing container. This helps make sure I'm getting the best possible mix between the dye and IPA, and also make sure the dye is flowing through the lattice structure and fully covering the part. I've actually ended up using this little magnetic stirrer a whole bunch since I got it. it works great for cleaning small parts. I just use the disposable Tupperware container filled with IPA, drop my parts in, and let it run. I use much less IPA with this setup, and it's way easier to clean than larger cleaning tanks. For the dye process, I added the 2% black using a glue syringe and waited for a little over 15 minutes before pulling it out of the dye bath. Looks really good. I think we got a good coverage on everything and about the maximum dye penetration I'm going to get from the process. I'm going to let it air dry for a little and then pop it into the heated UV cure box for a 20 minute cycle at 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The part looks super weird in the cure box. The dye coverage looks good to the naked eye, but as soon as it gets under a UV, there's this splotchiness to it all. Because it looks fine in real life, it's not a problem, just a strange visual thing going on. I dip washed it in IPA again after this to get as much of the extra dye off as I could, and then just let it air dry overnight. The next day it was pretty good, but still seemed a little tacky to the touch. I was a little worried about this at first, because I really don't want this dye to transfer to my face or head when I'm wearing this thing. Fortunately, I put it back in the UV box for another 20 minute cycle and it felt totally fine after that. The look of this thing is pretty wild. It has a translucency to it, which is really interesting. When you shine light on it normally, it looks pretty solid and has kind of a satin black feel to it. As soon as you get light in behind it though, it really becomes translucent and plays around with the light in a very cool way. It's really neat that you can see the lattice structure come through because of this. During the process of dyeing the back pad, I also stumbled into something that changed my direction for the design of the front mask. As I was dyeing the pad, I left the supports on the print, and they happened to stick up out of the dye bath. These supports are removed from the main part and discarded later, so I didn't really care if they got dyed or not. After everything was in the UV cure box, I noticed that the supports ended up with this really interesting black to clear fade pattern on them. Thought some more about it and decided that it would be great as an intentional move on the main body of the front mask. I could just dye the front part of the mask and then have it fade to clear near my face for a totally unique look to the part. Functionally this would work really well because the mask area near the displays would still be blackened and would work well for light leakage blocking. I would also only need to submerge the front section of the mask during the dye process so this would help save on IPA. With my new plan in place I started the printing process of the main mask. What I really like about this fade concept is how it relates to the design story for the actual custom mask part itself. If you remember back to episode 5, the front display side of the mask is always the same for all input scans. The side of the mask near the face is the thing that actually adapts. Conceptually, the custom face gasket part fades from a static, always the same set of geometry, to a custom form that matches the input scan face. Visually fading the part from black to clear reinforces the idea of a transition from a static to custom part. So I have a pretty clear idea of how I'm going to get this done. The technique I used to dye the back pad works super well, so I'm essentially going to do the same thing to this larger custom face gasket part. The only real difference is that I'm going to underfill this larger tub of my dye and IPA mix, so it only covers the front portion of the mask. That should give me the front to back fade look I'm going after in my finished part. The only tub I had handy that was big enough for the mask was pretty large, so I decided to put some rocks in Ziploc bags to take up some of the volume of the dye mix. This will let me use a lot less IPA and dye mixture to get the job done. One thing that is kind of annoying about this process is that it generates a lot more waste than I like. Parts that come out of a resin printer are usually soaked in IPA to clean off any excess uncured resin. 
I usually reuse IPA multiple times for soaking and cleaning the parts after printing, but with the dye mixed in, I obviously can't really reuse it again unless I also want the parts to be dyed black. I think I'll just store the premixed black dye IPA in a jug and hopefully get another use or two out of it in the future. So now I have my printed part and stylish bagged rocks in there. I'm also putting in a piece of scrap aluminum I had under the front of the mask. This will level it out in the tub, making it so the fade detail is parallel to the front of the mask once it's done soaking. Otherwise, I'm doing exactly what I did before, mixing in 2% dye, turning on the magnetic stirrer, and letting it sit for around 15 minutes. After that, I'll just pull it out to air dry for a minute or two, and then pop it in the UV cure box for its final finishing. I've got the mask in the UV cure box, and man, it looks really crazy. The UV light really amplifies that fade detail, which is just nuts. I'm just so happy I ended up doing the mask parts this way. If I just ordered the parts from an outside vendor, I would never have gone down the dye path and this fade look would never have happened. It's just so great to get exposed to new concepts and directions like this from learning a new process. It's funny how many little random things pop up when you're doing work on a project like this too. Without that little bit of scrap sticking out of that first testing on the dye bath, it would never have gotten to the place the mask is at now. So with that, I've got all my flexible parts done and ready to go. Both the back pad and custom face gasket came out great. The look of the die is not something I would have ever planned on, but I couldn't be happier with the way it looks. Because I'm doing all my printing locally, I can keep developing these parts out really quickly going forward, which is a great place to be at. really like the physical material properties of this ADA durometer material too. Because the front gasket is custom fit to my face, I really don't need that level of soft padding like you'd find on a normal headset. You can almost get away with a solid plastic material for this, but I thought something that had a little bit of give to it would be more comfortable for wearing over long periods of time. Well, we're finally nearing the end of this one. I removed all the masking tape from the parts and did some final light cleanup on everything. The inserts are all clear and it looks like things are good for the final assembly. It's just amazing to see all the parts sitting here and ready to go for the final build. I definitely had to be flexible with what I was going to end up with for the final parts in this process, but I think that flexibility allowed for the project to go in some new directions. Not being overly locked in on trying to make a perfect copy of the renderings from the previous episode, it allowed for something really special to come out of the final parts. I think this should look pretty great when I have the headset turned on and my face lights up with the displays. I'm excited to see how it all comes together for the last episode in the series. Hope to see you there.